Welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to use our knowledge of partial derivatives to solve the following problem. I've given you the function fxy equals the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. In part a, we will sketch the graph of this function. In part b, without computing its partial derivative, we're going to find all points a, b, where the partial derivative with respect to x is zero. And finally, in part c, we really will do the computation. We'll compute partial f by partial x and confirm that our answer in b is correct. Okay, so for part a, we're asked to sketch the graph of the function fxy. Notice that this question doesn't involve partial derivatives at all. It's purely a question about 3D graphing. However, it's going to be used in part b, which does involve partial derivatives. So how do we sketch the graph of a 3D function? Ah, that's right. We look at the level curves. We set z equal to k. By setting z equal to k, we get the equation root 1 minus x squared minus y squared is equal to k. Now notice that since k is equal to the square root of some real number, k must be greater than or equal to 0. This means that we don't have any level curves below the xy plane. Our graph never dips into the negative z axis. Okay, so let's clean this up a bit. By squaring both sides, I get 1 minus x squared minus y squared is equal to k squared. And after a little rearranging, we can write this as x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus k squared. Hopefully, you recognize this as the equation of a circle. It's a circle centered at the origin with radius square root 1 minus k squared. Now observe that this actually gives us another condition on k. We can't take the square root of a negative number, so k is going to have to be less than or equal to 1 here. So if you combine that with our first constraint, we see that k has to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So let's try plotting some of these level curves. When k is 0, we get a circle centered at the origin of radius 1. It looks something like this. When k is, say, 1 half, we get a slightly smaller circle centered at the origin. And we can keep doing this all the way up to k equals 1. At k equals 1, we actually just get a point. We just get the origin itself. So there you have it, our contour plot. We'll raise those contours up to the appropriate heights in R3 and build the frame of our function fxy. You can see here that our function is actually going to form the upper half of a sphere of radius 1. Pretty cool, huh? This equation describes the upper cap of a sphere of radius 1. Now, I know what you're thinking. Come on, Zach, how did you know that that was the upper half of a sphere? How do you know it's not just some other dome shape? Well, here's another way you can think about it. If you set z equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared, then after squaring both sides to simplify this thing, we're going to get the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Now, if you square root both sides again, you get the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. And this expression on the left-hand side, you may recognize as our distance formula. This is the distance from the point x, y, z to the origin in R3, right? So what this equation is saying is we're taking all points x, y, z that have distance exactly 1 to the origin, right? That gives us a sphere of radius 1. But of course, since z is equal to the square root of some real number, z must be greater than or equal to 0. That's why we're just getting the upper half of our sphere. Okay, folks, we're now moving on to part b. Without computing this partial derivative, find all points a, b such that the partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b is equal to 0. Now you might think, how the heck am I supposed to do this without computing the partial derivative? Ah, but now think back to part a. We just graphed this function, right? Here's the graph of f of x, y. It's the upper cap of a sphere. We also have a graphical interpretation of the partial derivative, right? At a point, a, b in the domain, the partial derivative with respect to x is the slope of the tangent line at a, b in the x direction. So, for example, if I take this point here, which sort of sits in the front part of our sphere, then the partial derivative with respect to x is really the derivative along this cross-section. It's the slope of this tangent line shown in blue. 
At this point, you can actually see that we have a negative partial derivative with respect to x. After all, if we take a small step in the positive x direction, our tangent line is pointing us downward, right? Our function has a tendency to decrease, the tangent line is negatively sloped, and therefore the partial derivative is negative. If instead I consider this point on the back half of my sphere, then my tangent line here has a positive slope, right? My function has a tendency to increase as I move parallel to the x-axis along this curve. Sorry, those are my onion rings. Be right back. Okay, I got my onion rings. Now I'm all set to tackle the rest of this problem. So we left off by saying that the partial derivative at this point is negative. The partial derivative at this point is positive. Maybe it then makes sense that at this point right here, right in the middle above the y-axis, my partial derivative is zero. After all, my tangent line, shown here in pink, is flat. My function doesn't really have a tendency to increase or decrease at this point, so my partial derivative is zero. Of course, there's nothing really special about this particular cross-section. We could have taken any cross-section by setting y equal to some k value, and the point right in the middle above the y-axis is going to give us a zero partial derivative with respect to x. So really, the points that we're looking for are the points below this ridge going over our sphere, right? They're the points with x-coordinate equal to zero and whose y-coordinate can be anything between this point over here and this point over here. But remember, our sphere has radius one. So y is allowed to go all the way from minus 1 to 1. The set of points where we get a partial derivative with respect to x that's equal to 0 are all points of the form 0y, where y goes between minus 1 and 1. Now let's verify this algebraically in part c. Once again, we're looking for all points where the partial derivative of f with respect to x is equal to 0. But now we're actually allowed to compute this partial derivative. As a reminder, our function is given by fxy equals the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. To find the partial derivative with respect to x, we treat y as constant and take the derivative as normal. So in this case, it looks like we're going to require the chain rule. The partial derivative of f with respect to x is the derivative of the inside partial over partial x of 1 minus x squared minus y squared times the derivative of the outside function, which is the square root function. Its derivative is 1 half times the inside 1 minus x squared minus y squared to the power of minus 1 half. Okay, I still need to do this partial derivative. I get minus 2x, that's the derivative of the inside, times 1 over 2 root 1 minus x squared minus y squared. If you'd like, you can clean this up by canceling the 2. That leaves you with minus x over the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. We want to know where this expression is equal to 0. Well, notice that this is a fraction, right? And the fraction is equal to 0 if and only if the numerator is 0. So this expression is going to be 0 when x is 0. Uh, but hold on, what about y? Well, y is allowed to be whatever you want, but we don't want to be taking the square root of a negative number, right? So we should restrict y to lie somewhere between minus 1 and 1. If it's outside that range, we're going to be square rooting a negative number. So our final answer is the set of all x, y, where x is equal to 0 and y is between minus 1 and 1, just like we found in part b.